very much, Ingo. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's great to see everybody. And I, I see a lot of uh, names of, from my various uh, li different lives. So it's great to see everybody. And feel free to use the chat and say hello, and say where you're from. It's, it's really nice for us to all have a chance to connect even while we're in the midst of social distancing guidelines. Uh, I wanted to thank Ingo for inviting me on this. And yeah, I think we were, it was, um, we were both giving talks. Maybe it was in California. I, I live in Madison, Wisconsin now. So I'm saying hello to you from Madison. And I realized, yes, actually I had forgotten. And I'm sorry, Ingo, I had forgotten to give my full bio on the, on the description. So uh, yeah, I, I'm running Healthy Minds Innovations, and I will talk a little bit more about our organization um, as we continue through. Um, uh, my background, I have, uh, I'm an engineer by training. I, I spent many years in the water treatment industry and then many years in the tech industry. I was at uh, Dell and Google, uh, living in many places. Uh, I was living in Asia and in Europe uh, for, for Dell and Google. And I've been working in this field for the past several years, and I'm really happy to share with you, though I did not realize that the session was going to be recorded. So I included some things that I thought were just, you know, we're just streaming live, but I will, I will, uh, I'm going to go forward with it anyway. Uh, so one of the things I thought I would share just as a fun thing, I was thinking about all the changes that we've gone through, uh, you know, in society uh, recently with COVID-19. And I was thinking about my own life and something, again, that I don't normally share, but I, I have kind of a, lots of different interests. And one of them, I used to be a semi-professional roller disco dancer. So uh, I used to do this in addition to my normal job. Uh, actually, I was performing professionally while I was at, or semi-professionally. I, I, didn't I, I didn't make enough money to live on it because I was only performing on the weekends. If I had gone full time, I could have lived on it. Um, and I used to get in trouble for it at work because uh, my, at the time I had a, a boss who was former military and he thought executives should be very serious and severe and having this guy do these crazy things, uh, you know, an executive team is, uh, hurts the rep of the senior team. But uh, I thought I would share, I'm going to go into sharing my screen. So we are going to talk about cultivating mental well-being, but I, I thought I'd share just a fun picture from um, my old performing days, which actually I always say I you know used to do this, but I was even performing last year, so I suppose it's not that long ago. But uh, this is these are from my old crazy roller disco performances uh, on skates. Uh, the the picture on the left it's actually a, from a newspaper article. After I was chastised for doing this stuff at work, I, like my, my work was upset about me having these crazy things, um, this newspaper article came out like two weeks later and my like, huge 6'4 colleague stro like, strode onto the sales floor and said, what's this article about what you're doing? And then uh, the picture on the right is a picture from last year from San Francisco. Uh, and it's uh, it's just interesting when I was thinking about, you know, traveling around. I used to travel around with a dance company and do these things. And now I've been roller skating in my living room, trying not to break things. <laughs> and that's kind of our new reality. But uh, uh, at the same time, I think there's a lot of interesting things we can explore, even though we're we're in challenging times. There are many interesting things for us to explore. So what I'd like us to uh, look at is... Why is well-being important and how is the science of well-being uh, important to us? Uh, I, as I mentioned, I'll share a little bit more about our organization. I'd like us to do some practice together uh, and then have a chance for discussion. I think it's uh, really nice for us to have a chance to connect with each other uh, while we're, again, having to do lots of different uh, distancing practices. So talking about the science and why is it interesting? There, there's a couple things that are, are really interesting from a uh, science perspective. I, uh, I think Ingo mentioned, you know, we, we started in this organization, Healthy Minds Innovations, uh, comes out of the pioneering research of Dr. Richard Davidson, who founded our organization as well as uh, the Center for Healthy Minds. And 
we've been looking at lots of different issues. Uh, actually, we the research that is being done uh, at the Center for Healthy Minds spans from prenatal all the way to kind of Alzheimer's research. And so there's a, a lot of things that we've been observing that are concerning in terms of trends. So even before this uh, you know, recent health crisis that we're in, we've been looking at um, kind of mental health and mental well-being as uh, kind of similarly uh, a, a really important health issue for kind of society right now. So here's uh, data from uh, the U.S. looking at diagnosis rates for depression from 2013 to 2016. If you can see, uh, this is uh, across different age groups, and it's rising uh, for every age group. Orange is 2013. Blue is 2016. And if uh, you look all the way in the left, the data for teens is horrific. It's a 63% rise of diagnosis rate for depression just in those three years. So there's uh, really discomforting trends across uh, all age groups, really severe in teens. I, you know, I think conjecture, you know, this is uh, likely impact of social media and uh, some, some of the other changes that are happening for teens, but something that we're clearly very, very concerned about. Similarly, if you look uh, across um, thinking about purpose and having a sense of purpose in life, uh, this is uh, data from uh, a study that looked at people from in the age range of 51 to 61 and looking at uh, using a standard kind of survey of purpose and then tracking kind of their mortality rates. And one of the interesting things that came out of this is that people who do not have a strong a sense of purpose, they die sooner. Uh, you know, under the same kind of cohort, age cohort, yeah, you will, you will end up um, dying sooner. It's kind of uh, a health indicator and a health risk like, like smoking. So uh, this is an interesting and concerning thing that we're seeing is folks who do not have a sense of purpose and um, can't identify and connect to a sense of purpose, um, actually it impacts your, your overall lifespan. Uh, similarly, we've seen similar things on loneliness, the things that are you know, societal issues that we see that are increasing and ha have really significant health impact. Uh, if you go and switch to thinking about our current situation and all of the changes and the upheaval that we've been going through, uh, this is uh, actually um, a study that was done based uh, after SARS, if you remember, that was uh, 2003. And actually this, um, you know, I think uh, last time I caught up with Ingo was in Toronto. Uh, this actually takes, um, this study was done on folks who were in Toronto who had to be quarantined. And looking at that, uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and depression were observed in 28.9 and 31.2% of quarantined um, uh, patients uh, post-SARS. And so, you know, the, the, the stress and impact of having a serious disease, of being quarantined and being in isolation, these are things that are significant and, and really concerning. I think you've probably seen there's a, a lot of the popular media has been sharing. There's been you know, new research that's been coming out and a lot of things that are expressing how the, um, the concern over mental health being the second wave of this COVID, COVID crisis that we were going to see a lot of um, issues uh, coming out of this. So uh, one of the things we think, you know, it's really important for us to think about and explore well-being. And one of the things that is really positive and um, the bright side of this is that well-being can be trained. It is a skill and it can be trained. It is not kind of an inadvertent outcome because of pleasurable activity, or you know, you just are happen to wake up on the right side of the bed. It's something that we can measure and we can train. And so this is actually what we focus on as an organization and, and what we're going to be exploring a little bit today. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the couple things about the organization. So 
uh, we do have a vision. We're trying to support uh, kind of kindness and wisdom and compassion. Uh, we have two organizations that are connected. We have the Center for Healthy Minds, which is actually a division of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, which focuses on cultivating well-being and relieving suffering through a scientific understanding of the mind. So this organization, both organizations I mentioned, were founded by Dr. Richard Davidson, who did some of the uh, very early studies of connecting long-term meditators to EEG and MRI machines, and really understanding that uh, these contemplative practices of meditation, uh, types of uh, different forms of meditation, actually have a physiological impact on the brain, that we actually change our physical structure of our mind through these practices. And this was one of the things that led to the widespread kind of popularity in, uh, our, you know, at least in the West, of, of mindfulness practices and meditation practices when it was understood that these are not just in the realm of uh, kind of spiritual, theoretical um, impact, but there is also a physical impact. And I think this has really helped spur the growth of kind of the whole secular uh, mindfulness movement. And um, this was really spurred by a kind of challenge that was posed uh, to Dr. Davidson by the Dalai Lama of saying, you know, wh why do you folks with all your fancy equipment and science knowledge always focus on uh, kind of disease and dysfunction? Why don't you look at positive things like kindness and compassion and flourishing. And so that was really the establishment of understanding and looking at um, kind of how do we help people flourish and really develop well-being. Uh, the second challenge came several years later to say, now that you've established this as, an, as a field that is widely recognized and is, has you know, lots of publications, how do you then help people? How do you change their lives now that people recognize that this is important? And so that's how Healthy Minds Innovations was founded. We are a 501c3 nonprofit uh, that is focused on translating science into tools to cultivate and measure well-being. So we, again, uh, I think we're excited about the fact that we can measure well-being and we can cultivate it. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we do that together. So uh, I, I thought I'd give you one example of research that was done uh, at, the, at the center. And... Uh, and, and it'll illuminate a little bit about kind of the, the approach of using science to then explore well-being. So this was a study that was done, um, you know, Dr. Davidson, uh, and uh, was led by one of um, the former uh, members of the center, uh, Antoine Lutz. And uh, these studies, I love them, but they make me laugh because they're sometimes they they seem really. Uh, Crazy, but uh, uh, in the sense that I, I started this, before I go into this study, there's one that I just am amazed at. They were trying to figure out kind of stress response and they, the scientists thought of this really brilliant way of trying to measure stress response. They put the, um, the ingredients from hot peppers uh, on a little patch, uh, like a little like dot on the wrist and it would create a blister that was painless, but it would have, you know, blister fluid in it and they would do a stressful study and then use a, a needle to extract the stress response fluids from the blister. And I thought, wow, that's really amazing to think about. Uh, this study was um, more straightforward, but it actually involved pain. So this study was done. There was a signal to let uh, participants know that the study was going to start. And then a hot probe was placed on the skin that would get very, very hot, but not burn the skin, but it would hurt, it would hurt a lot. And, uh, and, and it was a study to kind of like explore pain response and dealing with pain and participants were, were you know, explained that that's what they were doing. And they were divided into two cohorts. There were long-term meditators that had um, a, a very long time practice and they were asked to kind of use their practice to help them cope with the experiment. And they were doing open presence type of it's a Tibetan practice. Um, and then there was non-meditators, folks who had no experience with meditation, and they were just, you know, uh, members of the research study and saying, hey, well, we're going to, you know, explore pain response. So again, the people are uh, you know, 
going into the study, understanding what they're doing. Uh, let's take a look at what it looks like and the pain response. So there was a measurement, the vertical axis is the response of the pain network. So they were hooked up uh, to diagnostics so they could see what the response in the brain was. And this is over the x-axis is time. So we took the different folks together um, and the meditators first. Let's look at them. They enter the study, they get the signal, the studies, you know, the, the probe is about to get, uh, get heated up. Then they get the probe heats up to the temperature that hurts and they get a pain response. And then the probe is removed and they don't feel any more pain and the pain network in their brain stops activating and they're back to baseline. And then they took the non-meditators in, same procedure, um, and they did this over multiple times, and they have the pain response, or they have the signal, they understand that, you know, they're going into the experiment again. And interestingly, their pain network starts responding right away, before they feel physical pain. They're actually stressing, this is them stressing and worrying about the future, the fact that they know that the pain response is going to come, or that the, you know, the actual physical pain is about to come. Then they get the probe, get applied to their skin, probe gets removed, there's no longer any physical pain, but their pain network is still activated for quite a long time. They're now reflecting on how much it hurt and reliving it and kind of still stressing about it. So if you think about stress and stress in your life, most of the mental stress that you have is likely either worrying about the future or kind of regret about the past or, or kind of rehashing and you know trying to um, cope with issues that have happened in the past. And so that is that blue curve. Right. Even before the thing starts, you're stressing about it. And then afterwards, you're still stressing about it. And so, uh, you know, meeting with somebody challenging that you dislike, uh, getting worked up before the meeting or the, before you meet with them, then you actually have the painful meeting, you know, could be indeed truly painful. But then afterwards, you're still thinking about it, thinking about why didn't I say that? How could they do this? And, and allowing it to impact your mental health. How much better would it be to just not worry about it until actual real discomfort is there and as soon as it's over, kind of move on? And that's actually what the meditators were able to do with this. And this is one of the things that we are, it was so interesting to study and see from, from our uh, scientist's perspective. And then also it's interesting for us to consider that we can train our mind to allow ourselves to look more like the gray response. And so this is one example of, of kind of what we like to train in ourselves and, and how we'd like to think about well-being. So uh, we have a framework that uh, we use to look at this. We believe there are four critical aspects of well-being, uh, and these are awareness, connection, insight, and purpose. And what we can do is evaluate each one and we can train skills in each one. And I want to talk about each one a little bit. So um, I mentioned it's awareness, connection, insight, and purpose. Uh, awareness is the first one. And we find, uh, we feel awareness is quite foundational. Uh, here is where mindfulness is a key component. Really being able to be present in the present moment, kind of be aware in the present moment, focus our attention on what we want to focus our attention on. So we are able to direct our attention to what we think is important, and we can notice what we're paying attention to. So we like to talk about awareness and kind of meta-awareness. So um, let's use that previous pain study. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, what the, the meditators were doing was an open presence practice. They were just noticing what was happening right at that exact moment. So when the signal was signaling that the pain network was, or the pain experiment was about to start, 
they were like, oh, yeah, the signal is there. And that's all that was there at that moment, right? They didn't need to then, then take their attention and distract themselves to think, oh, man, I hope it doesn't hurt that much this time. I hope I'm, you know, it's not going to be really uh, longer than before. I hope it's not going to be different. They could just be like, oh, yeah, that signal is there. Uh, so we want to be able to do that. And notice what we're paying attention to. Uh, if, if you've ever noticed yourself you know, in a talk, maybe even right now, where you're not paying attention to the speaker and you start thinking about other things and then you notice, oh, I, I'm not paying attention to the speaker. Uh, let, let me pay attention to what's going on in this talk. That's meta-awareness of understanding where your attention is focused. So those two things together are very important from uh, an awareness perspective because one is they allow you to be in tune with a lot of things that are happening um, in, in your kind of world and environment. It's kind of one that we like to look at kind of in the mind, in the body, in the environment. Um, and they also allow you, if you have meta-awareness, you can direct where you want to focus your attention. So we have practices looking at how do we develop awareness? How do we improve our ability to pay attention to what's happening uh, right now? The second component is connection. And connection, we look at being able to connect with others, people in our lives, with the spirit of appreciation, kindness, and compassion. Uh, we want to be able to take different perspectives, um, have a more positive outlook, and when we engage with folks, uh, recognize and see if we have biases, and, and have empathy for others' feelings. This has also been uh, very clearly demonstrated to be trainable. You know, I think um, I always laugh about this because I grew up in the Northeast of the US um, outside of Boston. And the, the general default mode in Boston, at least for me, from where I grew up and my friends, even though I grew up in a quite like comfortable town, it was not, uh, you know, hard in any way. But uh, the default is if I don't know you, you're potentially going to do something bad to me. So I don't like you because I don't know you. And I've noticed that I have that as from when I grew up, you know, if I bump into a stranger, I'm like, Ooh, I, you know, like I, I have a natural kind of distaste for uh, people that I don't know uh, on the street. And, and you can actually change this. You can shift this perspective if you want. Uh, and, and so this has been something that I've been working on over time to change my natural response uh, and and look more towards kind of um, kindness and and connection. So it's uh, it's interesting. Um, yeah, it's actually been very important for me in work as well. My uh, my friends, as I mentioned, I, you know, I don't know why, but uh, my friends loved to brawl growing up. I mean, they were you know they just to get into fistfights very regularly. Um, and I always remember kind of all our parties were broken up, and the police would come, and there was fights on the street, and uh, and that kind of spirit of direct confrontation uh, is really problematic, actually, in a lot of work settings. And so it has actually been really one of the big problems of my like, working life. And, and so this has been great to have skills to be able to work on and improve on something that has really caused me a lot of issues. Uh, the third is insight. Uh, and, and this is something you know, I think we're really excited to be able to work on and be able to help uh, people see more is really exploring the self and the world around us with a spirit of curiosity to improve our self-knowledge and, and promote a healthy sense of the self. Uh, this I find super interesting of exploring the way that we think and the way that we interpret the world our narratives that we use are often lazy narratives that we've developed shorthand ways of thinking over time. And if you really explore them, sometimes they're not correct. They're actually not true the way that we think about things. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, the small example, and which is also related to connection is, but if you think about, if you ever have an argument with somebody, um, what I found, if you spend some time to explore it a little more deeply, a lot of times your perspective, while it may be true, is not the entire truth and it doesn't capture everything. And if you're able to expand that, it allows you to approach things with a, a much 
more positive spirit. And so we, we want to, to do that in uh, kind of multiple different ways. And then the fourth is purpose. And earlier I had mentioned, you know, I'd shared that research around looking at alignment to purpose actually is, is actually correlated with mortality um, and mortality rate. Uh, I think the, if you look at purpose, this is something again, very strongly linked to well-being. And here is having a sense of clear values uh, and having a sense that your life and your pursuits are meaningful. So being able to identify what's really important to you and then also being able to stay connected to it and have things, the small things in your life be connected to a purpose that is, you know, and ideally a purpose that's a little bit larger than just your own self-interest. And that is really um, strongly aligned to well-being as well. And, and again, we can train uh, and these skills. In fact, actually, I thought I'd share. I maybe I should stop sharing to show you this. Um, I thought I'd share. You know, I'm looking at insight, and actually, it actually helps me on a lot of these different characteristics. I brought my journal, and to just to, this is one of the practices that I do to support this. But I, I thought I'd share. It's the. Uh, I journal every day, and this is kind of what my journal looks like. This is my, what month is this? I don't know, <laughs> but this is January. And what I do for this, this is a, every day I write an entry. And I, uh, I track, there's a number of things that I track in my life. And I like to see, you know, there's certain things that are just like daily metrics, like what time I got up, what time I went to bed, uh, you know, I used to spend a lot of my free time surfing, uh, you know, did I surf or not? You know, what kind of, uh, you know, did I roller skate or not? You know, what kind of things that I did. Uh, and then every month I look back on this and I see if I'm living the way that I have hoped to live. Am I living the way that I feel is aligned with my values and what I care about and the way that I feel is a healthy life? And then in the back of my journal, uh, this is kind of more of my, this is more like a normal writing instead of that kind of micro writing. This is just kind of like normal size writing where every, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks I reflect and, you know, topics that are pertinent to me right now or, or big issues, I kind of write and reflect on them. So those are, it's the way that I do this that helps me kind of stay connected to purpose, allows me to explore the way that I'm thinking about issues and also allows me to track, you know, if I'm living the way that I like to live. So I um, just thought I'd share a, a fun uh, you know, thing that I, that I do each day. Uh, and, and it's been really surprising to me sometimes. Sometimes when I look back on it, I am surprised that I am living quite aligned with what I'd hoped. And other times I look and I realize, oh, I'm really not living the way that I had planned. I'm doing things very differently than, uh, you know, my, my goals. And so it's, it's been really helpful for me to, for, to look at that. So, so these are the four pillars. And, and what I'd like us to do um, is do some practice. And actually, you know, I can stop our share for the, for the practice as well. Um, I, I thought it would be nice for us to do a little bit of a, a combined practice and we can look at, uh, do an awareness and connection practice kind of combined together today. And so uh, if that works for everyone, let's do a practice together. And so I'd like you to sit in a way that allows you to be alert, but relaxed. Sitting, if you're in a chair, sitting upright is good rather than leaning too far back or too far forward. You can close your eyes if you like. If you prefer to keep your eyes open, I suggest averting your gaze down. And let's settle into this. You can make any adjustments you need to feel comfortable, but let's settle into this taking a couple deep breaths.
Now resuming normal breathing. Maybe we can just focus our attention on the breath. Can you notice the movement of your body as you breathe? Can you notice where do you feel the breath most prominently as you inhale and exhale? What else do you notice about the breath, the, the rate of your breathing, feelings of effort or ease? Let's turn our attention to the mind. Can you notice the thoughts that are coming up? Can you pay attention to the thoughts that are springing up in your mind? Let's look at emotions. Can you think of any emotions or notice any emotions? Do you feel any emotions present for you right now? Or maybe an absence of emotion? Let's turn our attention to the, our body overall. Earlier we were looking at the, the breath. Let's pay attention to our entire body. Just notice any sensations in the body, anything on how your body feels right at this moment. Let's expand our attention to the environment that we're in right now. If you're inside you know, the room that you're in, if you're outside to you know, your external surroundings, but and if you have your eyes open, if you to, to look, or you can keep your eyes closed if you prefer, just to consider the space that you're in. Let's notice, let's notice the sounds in the space.
what sounds are present. See if you can notice sounds that are both near and far, if there are different sounds that are hitting your ears. should consider temperature. What is the temperature of the environment that you're in? Is it comfortable? Is it hot? Is it cold? Just notice the temperature. I'd like to ask you to consider one thing that you appreciate about the environment that you're in right now. It's one thing that you really appreciate about where you are right now. Now I'd like to shift to a connection practice. In our current times, we may be very distant and isolated from others and connecting with them only remotely, or we may be in very close quarters with others and interacting to a possibly greater degree than we have in a long time or maybe ever uh, with uh, people in our household. And so I'd like to consider connection. So I'd ask you to think of someone who is important to you in some way. I'd like you to think about, is there something that you can do for this person, an act of kindness that would really make them feel really good. And it could be a small gesture. And again, it could be something that you do remotely or it could be something that you do in person. Please think about something that you can do in act of kindness. I'd like you to think about how this other person will feel receiving this act of kindness from you. I'd like you to notice how you feel right now.
And with that, I'd like to bring this practice to a close. If you had your eyes closed, feel free to open them. We'll bring our attention back to our call. As I mentioned, we'd have a chance for discussion and I'll get a chance to check out the chats. I'd like to do some small group discussion. We'll break out into breakout groups uh, and then we'll have a chance for group, uh, the full group uh, Q&A. I forgot one thing. I should, have, I should have mentioned this. We have a free app, actually. We've made it freely available for individuals. Um, it's called the Healthy Minds Program. So if you want to continue these practices, and um, we have resources on our website.